Hello, I am Catherine. Uh, it is a total honor to be back uh, to ICME. Uh, a decade and change has flown by since, uh, and uh, the world is a little different. Um, but uh, I am currently in Washington, DC, uh, so the light may change behind me as we go and talk for the next hour. Um, but I am missing California. Uh, so um, for you folks uh, in lovely Palo Alto in the Bay Area, um, lucky you. <laughs> Though I am loving DC, don't, don't get me wrong, it's just California at heart. Um, I, uh, I thought that I would first uh, start off by just, uh, uh, since we are not co-presents in any way, I can almost invite you into my virtual home. Um, and if I did invite you into my virtual home, you would... Um, trip over an instrument or two and then pet my cats. And then the first thing that you might see is a big uh, bookcase uh, like you see right here, uh, organized by color, multicolored. Um, really the, the only way to do it and the way that I'm committed to doing it from now on, um, which was a, a tricky uh, bar to set for myself the last time that I moved recently, um, but it happened. Um, and uh, I'd invite you in a little closer, if you go, can go to the next slide. Uh, and uh, in that wall of color, uh, you uh, may see some themes pop out uh, in my bookcase. Um, on the right hand side, that particular knowing shade of yellow of graduate math texts. Uh, I think uh, you can almost spot the PDE book that I used. Uh, was it CME 304, 302? I forget the numbers at this point. Um, maybe a numerical optimization in there as well. Um, but, uh, but math is, is well represented on this bookshelf. Um, and uh, on the other side, uh, just legions of language books, uh, four volume uh, Hungarian English dictionary, of course, that you need. Uh, too many learn your owns on your own time from Zulu to Hindi uh, uh, and beyond um, Danish grammar, Finnish. Um, this is just, uh, you know, I, I like to think that a bookshelf is a window into the soul a little bit. And so you can now directly see uh, parts of who I am uh, very tangibly represented here um, on this bookshelf. Um, I was a, a lovable weirdo as a child when all of this started that would equally kind of pour over a Hungarian dictionary for fun while doing math problems with my dad, who was a high school teacher. Um, and um, I've always been looking for ways to combine these passions together. Um, and uh, these passions have really doggedly followed me throughout my life. Um, and, uh, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about where they've led. Um, so next slide, please. So some background. Um, I am a computational linguist. Uh, I did my grad studies uh, at uh, Stanford in ICME and then also in linguistics then did uh, my undergrad at UCLA. Uh, and that really allowed me to deeply indulge these twin passions for language uh, and math. Um, I uh, have really built a career in technology. A technologist is a weird word that uh, I don't like, um, but that I haven't found a better suitable one. Um, uh, but I've really been able to spend a, a lot of my time um, thinking about um, ambitious and thorny problems in communication and community. Um, and I've been able to do it for the last decade and more around um, different companies, really with a front seat to uh, some you know, interesting changes and in innovation and destruction that happens in uh, working in technology uh, for that period of time. Um, uh, and uh, uh, across uh, communication community focused products like Nextdoor, Facebook, Foursquare, um, and now Slack, where I lead up um, international product expansion. Um, I'd say the, the through line in all of this, uh, or um, the thing that I am really uh, interested in is, is sort of issues of access and technology and how to build tech that is both considerate of different people, culture, and language. Um, and uh, utilizing, you know, interests and passions both in computational math and linguistics to make some of this change happen. Next, please. 
So uh, when you care about uh, language and you want to build, uh, do uh, things out in the world, you need to get out in the world. Um, and um, Stanford is an incredible place uh, to learn about natural language processing. I'm truly at the forefront um, of that field and some fantastic people to collaborate with across mathematical linguistics. Um, but also in my time in graduate school, I got to take baby steps to um, understand what it is to truly work out um, beyond uh, California or North America, um, be it in um, uh, Baidu headquarters through a Chinese uh, internship program and collaborated through Stanford Engineering where I worked on uh, machine translation across English and Chinese articles on Wikipedia. Um, or um, using a background in computational math to do analytics at CERN in Switzerland, where I got to spend a lovely summer um, and uh, experience a little bit of high energy physics. Um, and then uh, a year spent in the middle of graduate school um, on a Fulbright fellowship in Budapest, Hungary, thinking about how to find connections from well-studied optimization problems and then models of machine translation. Um, but all of this was input um, for uh, a career that happened afterwards that um, I will tell you about in the next slide. So um, I, my start uh, was in computational math um, and my professional career started as a computational linguist um, at Facebook. Um, and uh, that was a very direct extension of my training in CME. Um, but eventually I turned to product and product management. And that's really where I've spent the majority of my time in tech. Uh, for a few reasons, I made the change. Um, one, I, I felt like I could use the rigorous program of computational math to advocate for problems, to better understand them, to help articulate more nuanced questions and, and really separate signal from noise. Um, and I think that a background in, in rigorous math that you would get in a program like CME um, is a, a really strong lens to be able to apply to thorny, messy problems. Um, it also has allowed me to really fluently partner with a lot of very smart people across disciplines um, where we have to get into the thick of it together. And um, uh, I'm called upon to wear many hats um, and, uh, and math uh, has been a, a, a friend uh, in those circumstances. Um, and um, finally also the um, a benefit of uh, being in product in particular, what led me down this path was um, a desire to um, want to own uh, and think about how to act on these problems beyond just analysis. So it gives the added benefit of not just stopping at analysis or recommendation, but instead thinking about um, how to drive a problem forward um, and uh, have um, some uh, decision-making power in a more immediate way. Um, so the majority of this talk is coming from the perspective of someone who has spent uh, their, uh, you know, the fruits of their math uh, and language background um, in product um, outside in the world trying to build technology um, that is considerate of language, culture, um, and access. Um, so that is uh, the level that I will come at you uh, for the rest of this talk. Um, next slide, please. Great, so I'm going to offer you a uh, flyover tour of uh, various projects, some quite far back in time, uh, others more recent, uh, that are uh, an intersection of both the technical and linguistic. Uh, and um, I, I am gonna try and get through quite a few of them uh, or a chunk of them here. Uh, we can decide where to linger or where to go forward uh, and then revisit with questions in the end. Um, but first stop, next slide. A total blast from the past. Uh, this is the project that uh, lured me out of graduate school originally. Um, but I presented to you uh, as the first thing here um, as uh, maybe the most interesting thing that you can have direct uh, deep experience with, which is a failure in some sense, um, an ambitious failure from which uh, I learned a lot. 
uh, and, uh, and I'm going to tell you um, a, a tiny bit about graph search, what it was, uh, and, how, uh, and how we built it now. So uh, next slide, please. Way back in, uh, gosh, maybe 2011, uh, Facebook search looked a little like this. Um, I feel, uh, you know, dynasauric to, to tell you this, but that, that it is true. Truth, I tell you. Um, a, you would type into a Facebook search box um, and back uh, would come a list of entities. Um, these are pages, places, people. Um, but uh, fundamentally, anything that you would type in that search box was returning an entity to you. And search itself was navigational. Um, so search is something that you would use to get from place to place uh, around the website, um, but around the, the app at the time. Um, but it was not something that you could ask deep questions of uh, and get a, a results page back from. Um, it merely took you from point A to point B. Next slide. Um, but uh, Facebook is a social graph with uh, entities as nodes um, in that graph that are connected um, uh, by edges that are relationships from these entities. Um, they contain both general information and social information. Um, here you can see um, a user will have a user ID and may have a bi-directional connection with another user as a friend. Um, or they may also be connected to a page through some kind of action, through liking, um, uh, maybe to another page with a connection like a workplace. Um, entities are uh, various um, from photos, places, posts, people. Um, Facebook has this vast graph of structured information. And it did at the time as one of the marked differences between the rest of the web, um, the unstructured rest of the web. So the, the question um, that was, was pressing and interesting was, how do we let people ask questions about this social world, their own social world? Uh, how do we let them query the social graph? Um, next slide. So um, at the time, um, around 70% of web queries were keywords, um, just a string of words, nouns, um, often proper nouns that would be strung together through whatever search box looking thing you could find, typically Google, uh, that would uh, return things back to you. Um, and keywords are very good at retrieving named things, but they lose a lot of information about relationships. So for example, um, if I was to type in something like Friends Stanford uh, into a, a, a search box uh, as my question, say, um, there are many things it might map to, uh, many possible meanings. Um, go to the next slide, please. Um, maybe I'm asking about um, people who go to Stanford right now. Um, Perhaps I'm thinking about uh, friends of mine who've graduated from Stanford in the past. Uh, I'd love to be able to see where they're working now or reminisce. Uh, um, uh, maybe uh, people who actually work at Stanford, if I actually wanted to, to talk to Karen or some of the other professors here, you know, I wanna directly find people or who live at Stanford, given that it's an address or location, let alone being named Stanford. All of these possible answer, answers, responses, um, you know, uh, legitimate uh, questions that could come out of uh, query like friend Stanford. Um, now, uh, you could imagine a, a horrific series of UI filters that one might present to you where you might be able to go and directly select what uh, particular connection that you were most interested in at the time um, to see it. Um, but uh, no one has time for that. Uh, w was deemed um, that that we can do one better. Um, why not have this light bulb moment, which we did? Next slide, please. Which was to use language um, to let people ask questions of the social graph. Um, so the light bulb moment was uh, looking at uh, language as being uh, 
this query language, a natural language interface for search. Um, the idea is that one query, uh, you know, uh, or like a query uh, suggestions could always be constructed in natural language, um, expressing the very precise intention that each of these queries is interpreted by the system. And that would mean that as the person who's asking a question, you'd know in advance whether or not the system has correctly understood your intent before actually selecting and executing a search. Um, this could be robust to lots of different kinds of uh, input that would go into a search box, be it these natural language queries or keywords, maybe par partial queries, but all going back to a more robust natural language um, interface for how you interact with the social graph. Um, so uh, in, uh, in typical fashion at the time, a, a team of people were assembled to tackle it. Uh, lots of smart folks uh, started on the problem and I joined at the prototype stage um, to be one of the contributors to this natural language interface. Um, originally lured out of graduate school um, from focusing on linguistics to then um, be in the trenches um, and look at, at this problem. Um, Next slide, please. So how something like this might look, you know, when we talk, start looking at what the um, NLP interface like this might be, you know, think about like, oh, what are partial input queries that people could put in? Um, you know, maybe it is an entity that they're looking for a first name, um, a series of relationships, be it, you know, uh, looking for friends, um, a name, a place, uh, maybe they're looking at photos. Um, uh, this a partial input query would then go through um, a, an NLP module, natural language processing module, um, and then produce a, a suggested set of queries um, that would be associated both with text that could be understood by um, the searcher, the end user, um, as well as a direct semantic output that then could be queried um, against our search backend. Uh, and there's two basic semantic operations that we thought of in, in dealing with things like this. One, the idea that people will want to filter. So like given a group of people, or maybe I want to filter by their city of residence. And also sort of the operation of, of apply. Given a, a group of people, maybe I want to see all entities of something associated with those people, see all of their photos, say. Um, next slide, please. So the heart of uh, where I spent time um, was with this NLP module, uh, and uh, and you can imagine in a, you know very high level black box formats that there are lots of you know different areas of concentration um, that uh, have to happen in order to ultimately produce something that looks like um, a semantic uh, uh, meaning that is then paired with um, human readable text. Uh, so entity recognition, being able to isolate proper nouns that corresponds to enti entities in our system and then find all the possible entity segments and their semantic classes, going through lexical processing, you know, then can we be sensitive to the many different ways that people might phrase a query, are they going to produce plausible suggestions using graph search, you know, sensitive to inflection, singulars, plurals, whatever have you, you know, person agreement tense, you know, you just smash your keyboard, clearly something must come out of it. Um, and then um, finally, the question, can we semantically parse the input to produce like an unambiguous executable query? Um, next slide, please. So together with um, many smart people that I felt lucky to be uh, a part uh, of this team, we built this um, over uh, more than a year. Uh, and uh, Graph Search was launched in 2013 um, as a real world NLP based search system um, to much media fanfare. Uh, there was um, a large uh, gathering room of reporters, Mark Zuckerberg stood at the head of it, calling Graph Search the third pillar of Facebook. Um, and really, um, it was uh, um, a, a offering this natural language querying um, as an alternative to keyword search to people on Facebook, letting them now ask questions of the graph, um, probably used by millions and perhaps over um, if its lifetime billions of people every day um, to search. Um, but, but, next slide. 
fast forward to 2019, um, this is also a product now that is fully sunset after a series of wind downs. Um, there are so many things that one could say about this effort, uh, like the collective effort of so many smart people who were taking a very ambitious swing um, at what was a different way of looking at search at the time. Uh, but uh, there, and there are also, I could say, many things that I've learned from a project like this. Um, but, but most importantly, it's why something like this doesn't work out, doesn't transform the way that uh, we ultimately now search. Um, and among those many things, you can say that it fundamentally made the wrong bet about what people wanted. Um, keyword and browse search are the mode that people naturally ask questions in. Um, as keyed by Google, their interface uh, of choice, you know, the behaviors that have been uh, brought up um, and, uh, and cultivated um, over years and years. Um, but also um, a fundamental bet uh, that was misplaced about what people wanted in terms of precision. Maybe like a lot of the questions that people ask are less precise than you need from a natural language interface. Um, so uh, I offer this as uh, one small piece of, uh, of a project that um, had a great team, um, incredible uh, like technical prowess behind it. Um, and I'm sure that some things did last from the experience or were changed from it, but um, also just an important example of what is a swing and what is a miss uh, that has carried forward with me through um, the rest of my time in tech. Uh, so here, one chapter on a stop uh, among uh, a few other places that we will tour uh, as we fly over to the next project. Next slide, please. All right, I want to take it, tell you about a different project um, that actually worked out, um, but uh, that uh, got a lot less fanfare, uh, but ultimately that doesn't matter um, because uh, it, uh, it, it actually in, uh, brought about um, a lot of change that I'm personally proud to, to be part of. And um, that was really uh, debuting the idea of Facebook search on cheap phones. Um, next slide, please. Great. So uh, prior to the time of, let's say, next billion users, which is a, a term that uh, Google will use when talking about uh, the rest of the world or internet.org, uh, um, uh, and the huge push to be internationally inclusive and understand that the world is a very big place, I'd say that the internal model for a prototypical um, user person at Facebook was largely someone who mir mirrored the very niche profile of Silicon Valley. Um, all of my colleagues used iPhones, for example. Um, and uh, I, there was a huge opportunity uh, to be able to actually concentrate on the experience of um, the people that were using uh, search on low-end phone platforms. Um, at the time, it was still 300 million people every month uh, using Facebook across cheap phones, be it feature phones, low-end Android, Blackberry, have you. Um, but uh, the, these folks um, uh, also like, weren't specifically uh, supported by a dedicated effort beyond the general search efforts in that moment. Um, uh, people who are using these platforms span countries like Indonesia, India, Russia, West Africa, a smattering of South America and Mexico. Um, and the opportunity and goal here was really like, how can we make search great on this platform? Um, and also to change an internal mindset to actually care about um, these low end phone users uh, and doing that by uh, enabling people to better ask questions of uh, Facebook and the social graph at the time as measured for um, by searches um, over uh, monthly active users, monthly active people. Um, so this metric tells only one side of the story, more inclusive than that, um, but it was sort of a rallying cry for how we thought about um, going about a series of changes. Next, please. Lots of challenge here. Um, first, a, a huge gap um, in empathy. Um, this was an international audience that was fractured uh, by, you know, all around the world by markets. Um, 
that meant uh, that uh, there's just no one single place that you could look to to understand exactly what the experience was there, um, but really huge swaths of the world. Um, also fractured in terms of device, um, you know, a low end Android as many colors under the sun, let alone feature phones and black phone, um, Blackberry. Um, uh, you know, myriad levels of network conditions. Um, and um, all of this just proved, uh, you know, a challenging space to, you know, try and nail down to, you know, one uh, single um, uh, pithy statement uh, uh, of a goal or, or who we serve. Um, but then there's also a huge gap in what, uh, you know, what was the internal culture at the time? Um, uh, no one directly working on this as a full-time job uh, outside of teams, um, uh, you know, in other areas of the of the company. No one in search, I should say. Um, and uh, this was a real um, a, a opportunity to to go full feature phone to better understand how people were actually, you know, using Facebook um, in many places across the world um, and, and really required us to think about, you know, also how we um, understand them qualitatively and quantitatively. Um, and so we really needed to take a disciplined approach to um, uh, actually talking to people and building our own empathy muscle uh, and then um, uh, better logging what it meant to, uh, uh, you know, experience uh, or better understand their own experience on Facebook and so that we could ask specific and technical questions. Next slide, please. First, there wasn't a ready formed team. Um, so appealing to uh, many folks ac across the company was a job and an opportunity um, and ultimately required a full team to come together, um, even if it was a small team in order to happen. Um, and I, uh, um, by far the hardest to find at the time was a designer. Uh, again, uh, you know, designers um, were working on um, what was the forefront, uh, considered the forefront at the time. Um, but eventually um, I did find a great partner um, who was interested in um, building on um, what was uh, uncommon um, outside of Silicon Valley experience. Next, please. To do this properly, you have to go into the field, um, and this was an, a, a, you know, it was uh, utterly necessary to do this, you know, to actually see people where they are, meet them where they are, um, and um, see how they're using technology and in the, the context that they live, um, understand how they use search and markets. Um, uh, we took two research trips as a part of this effort, both the, to Indonesia and India. Um, that meant actually seeing people in their home um, as they are uh, searching across Facebook, you know, doing interviews in more formal settings. You can imagine behind a double blind glass mirror um, and with um, uh, translators uh, uh, that are uh, piping in uh, one language into my ear and speaking another um, to, uh, to people that they're um, talking with, polling, as well as just stopping people in marketplaces, ourselves going and experiencing network connections locally, uh, intercepting people in malls, shopping areas, the places where we could find them. Um, next up. There is a battery of changes that we could make from all of this information. Um, and we're a relatively small team so that needed to move quickly. And so then the trick in, in something like this is deciding what to do. Um, on the qualitative side, we want to hold ourselves to uh, a high bar. Um, and on the quantitative side, we want to actually measure the impact to make sure that uh, it uh, is uh, serving the people that we intend and actually, um, you know, driving change through things that we can measure. Next, please. So I want to walk you through a couple of things that worked um, and things that didn't. Um, so first, uh, a thing that worked, um, addressing UX challenges. Uh, you can see um, we directly started looking at the search entry point for accessibility and clarity here. Um, 
it, uh, you can see on the left hand side where search itself was a term that someone would need to click behind um, in order to be able to access. And on the right, something that looked a little bit more like your prototypical search box. Um, and it's obvious that something like this is going to improve searches, right? You're making it accessible it's at the top of this experience, no longer buried um, either um, behind a click or um, something that you would need to scroll to at the bottom of your feed. But the bigger question is, does this hurt anything? Um, uh, and uh, fundamentally what we found is um, search is not just a link that you click to, but it really is a way to ask and answer questions, but also a way to efficiently navigate the site. So by making it larger, you know, fundamentally it was opening up a set of behaviors that didn't necessarily cannibalize other good things that people were doing. It wasn't getting in the way of people. Um, and uh, it took um, many iterations um, in order to, and measurements in order to get there. Next up. Translation and localization are, are, are so key here. Um, and this is translation across uh, the words that you use, the tone in which they're used in localized imagery. You can see a sampling of just different search approaches at the time, um, be it different words in Bahasa Indonesia for what search meant, um, and actually trying to make intentional choices here uh, in order for um, Facebook to uh, best serve the people who are actually trying to um, navigate search, ask a question in this moment um, on their phone. Next up, please. Another thing was around um, search pivots. We really wanted to bring the, uh, the best of what was uh, the social graph uh, to the ease of whatever phone that you're using. Um, and um, uh, at this point, uh, knowing how much photos were so uh, crucial to people's experience of the product of other people um, was so important uh, in the experience on iPhone um, and on other types of Android, making this uh, a, a um, fundamental part of what is brought to these search results um, meant that we were giving sort of the best of graph search at the time while still honoring the, uh, the platform and medium that people were using. Next, please. So you can see sort of a, a battering of, of different things that we did here, um, talked about some of them, but also blended search results. So actually showing people um, you know, mixed search pages where they're seeing entities um, as well as, um, or a mix of entities together or that were ranked, um, being data conscious, uh, knowing that data was something that was high on people's minds and was um, a factor in their behavior and how they interacted with their devices was really important but also some things that didn't work out. Next slide. Um, ranking changes. Uh, you'd think on a search team, um, we're very, very interested in ranking changes. And uh, at the time, at least, it didn't prove to be one of the decisive factors in what was um, helping people get to what they were doing, at least the ranking changes that we had made, um, uh, trying to be sensitive to market. Uh, um, Device and browser specific fixes weren't something that dramatically improved at least the metrics that we were looking at. Um, anything that touches newsfeed or the main page of Facebook um, uh, mean, has a, a domino effect on many other things. And so we, we stayed away from it. And another thing to think about too is just iconography and design. You'll notice that there um, is a lot of words and there's a wordiness to this platform that wasn't true of other platforms at the time and, and may not be true of this platform anymore. But, um, but knowing that, that that was a more holistic change that needed to happen if we were going to present people with um, pictures as uh, fundamental pivots on how they're going to interact with this device versus words um, wasn't within the scope of what we were able to do. Next, please. So outcome here is this made search better for a whole lot of people um, and search volume grew by quite a lot um, as did satisfaction. It also was this debut uh, international research example um, from the search team specifically talking to folks uh, around the world. I'm sure there's been many, uh, many others to follow, um, but, um, but this was the start of an emerging markets search sub team um, that was focused on making cheap phones great um, for searching on Facebook. All right.
Next up, uh, making Nextdoor global, a first step. All right, next slide, please. So Nextdoor, um, it is a, a neighborhood platform, uh, sort of a neighborhood social network for folks who maybe uh, don't already use it. Um, it's, uh, it allows people to connect with their neighbors um, uh, within a defined space of, um, of a neighborhood um, that is bound by um, geospatial data. Um, verification is a, an important part um, of, this, uh, of this product. Uh, and uh, the idea is that this allows people to have more intimate conversations. Um, so it's a real platform for neighborhood uh, communication and local community. Um, at the time when I joined, it was greater than 50% of the neighborhoods in the US, but I believe that number is much, much higher now. Um, if you go to the next slide. Uh, when, um, when I joined Nextdoor, it was an operation for four years um, and they were finally ready to go international. Uh, and their why now moment was just that they had understood at this point a little bit about how growth worked in the US. Uh, and um, they had finally decided on a single place they knew they wanted to go. Um, their first foray into international was going to be the Netherlands. Um, uh, uh, that is a country that is uh, known for uh, being socially connected uh, across uh, many different uh, technology platforms, um, but also just reticent to a lot of, uh, or um, accepting of a lot of new technology. Um, and so I, uh, at this point, the number of people that were using uh, Nextdoor um, out of the country was zero. Um, so unlike many services where they will open their doors uh, and still be available broadly, even if they aren't specifically tailored to international markets, because Nextdoor is so reliant on geodata, um, it, it, you know, knocking on Nextdoor's door um, anywhere outside the US would just get you a splash page and a waiting list. Um, and so I was brought on to be the product manager um, to help shepherd this very first international launch. Um, as a part of this, uh, you have to really go through many steps in thinking about um, what it means to take your product international. Um, and the first is just deeply understanding and auditing the product that existed at that point. Um, at the time, this was the homepage of Nextdoor that you could find on a web. Um, and if we were a little bit more, if we were co-present, I would, I would uh, ask you to point out all of the North American US centric things that you could find uh, on, this, uh, on this page. Um, but uh, if we wanna spot together, you can see um, address fields that are assuming things like zip code and state. Um, the image in the back uh, uh, trying to show you what uh, you know, a neighborhood looks like is really showing you design of cars and wide spaces, you know, and has particular people in it that are walking a dog. You know, there's choices about the information density of what you see here. Um, all of these informed by, you know, the assumptions of what it meant to build a product for the US uh, and the people that were here building it, but these are North American assumptions. Um, and so we need to question them and break them. Um, next up, um, a deep audit of the product, uh, understanding all of the interfaces uh, that uh, you use to ultimately uh, you know, the, fulfill the life cycle of what it is for someone to uh, join uh, this community network, um, be it a cross platform, but also you know, Nextdoor had uh, and still uses um, physical mailing um, as a fundamental vector for how to invite people into different neighborhoods and verify them. Um, all of this too being built on geodata. That uh, is something that you need to very um, uh, carefully uh, obtain and make sure uh, is uh, true to life uh, in order to represent what these neighborhoods are from any place to place. So knowing this was a you know, host of questions that we needed to answer uh, in order to um, properly think about what it meant to, to serve the Netherlands. Next up. Then of course, understanding who we're building for. Um, we went to the Netherlands, um, hired uh, local uh, people and a Dutch team um, that could help uh, us sort through these problems. But fundamentally we're asking questions like what is neighborhood life like um, in the Netherlands? Uh, how is it different than what we know about the US? How is it the same? 
um, we found out a bunch of things uh, and uh, continue to find out more, I'm sure. But like a few examples, community is key. Um, many people in uh, uh, you know, a, a Dutch neighborhood would have much stronger ties to their neighborhood than what was typical in the US. Average of knowing five people by name, even more in smaller towns, genuinely wanted to meet people, even more local people, which can be different than the, the reticence of the bowling alone impetus for next door within the US. Um, local involvement was the norm. Uh, so even among people who didn't really even consider themselves involved, you know, I talk to people on the street and, you know, they say that, oh, I'm, you know, uh, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, the neighborhood lean back. Uh, and then um, you find that they regularly go to their local meetings or, you know, um, definitely voted in uh, the last elections or what have you. Um, and then also understanding that there's a lot of local use cases um, that aren't things that necessarily immediately translate uh, to what the, uh, the US product was built around, be it Dutch block parties or community events, you know, a bike lifestyle, um, you know, from parking routes, maintenance, security, um, as well as typical uses that you would find in the US. But all of this born out of actually talking to people um, and doing rigorous on the ground user research. Next up, understanding local digital life in addition to the question of like, what is a neighborhood and how does it function? Um, but like, where are people meeting their needs today in this moment if they don't have a service that's exactly like next door? Um, and what they were doing is turning to other services around communication and community to do what they needed. Small groups often found themselves on WhatsApp from 10 to 100 people typically would have neighborhood uh, WhatsApp uh, groups. Um, common solution among townhouses or different squares that people would live by. Sometimes they would go to Facebook and then a whole fractured market of different Dutch specific digital services that carried some of the same uh, you know, some of the same applications and verticals that uh, fall under next door, uh, be it uh, borrowing uh, or you know how they get recommendations for local handy people, um, crime and safety, selling their used stuff. Next up. Then um, to actually tackle this, a huge company-wide effort uh, to rally people around um, sort of the, from the technical to the design to all of the many ways in which um, uh, a product and market uh, like this is addressed. Next slide, please. Um, even just a, a journey across technical development, you can imagine there is a huge reckoning that must happen within a technical code base to um, be able to first isolate out what is language, what are strings, um, and then feed them and build out systems that can have proper tooling so that people can uh, uh, translate uh, what these strings are, um, let alone questioning some of the uh, you know, fundamental data assumptions we talked about, geodata, um, or um, thinking about what ongoing education is like for engineers as they join next door and the need to build into a system that is now fundamentally looking um, in a broader way at, at who they serve. Uh, and um, all of this is a lot of change to pack in with a project, um, but fundamentally going international is a huge reckoning for a company that makes you look at everything from um, you know, the, the technical implementation of, of how, you know, uh, a string is realized in your product to um, how you interact with uh, the customers and the people that you serve. Next up. Um, here is the first pictures at the time of uh, the next door site in Dutch that was launched. Um, and I can just go through a couple of these slides quickly so that you can see them. Here, Dutch, glorious Dutch in a few interfaces. Next slide. Um, see more there. And next. Next again. One thing that's interesting here is you can still see that there's a physical product of postcards that was um, something that needed to not only be localized, but, but figured out to be sent, you can imagine, across different postal services and reaching people's homes. But an interesting part of international is that international is often a huge lens for um, companies to be able to look at other parts of their product with new eyes. And so looking at even the way that postcards were uh, sense in the US then gave new opportunity to refine what those US postcards were at the time as they were being built for the Dutch market. And next. 
launched to great fanfare um, at a, a local community meeting. Um, and this ultimately became uh, the first market for Nextdoor outside of the US. Uh, it was a ton of fun to be part of ultimately bringing this out to the world. Um, and if you go one more slide, um, you can see um, now today, even I looked that Nextdoor is available um, just uh, uh, in many uh, varied places across the world as they continue to sort of march on in international expansion. Okay, I'm gonna roar through this, um, but now um, a little taste of Slack. So, uh, Slack um, here, uh, I have been at Slack for the last four and a half years uh, and worn many hats, but, um, but fundamentally, uh, I often think now uh, about the problem of how do we communicate at work? What does work mean? Um, I've worked um, in international, uh, both leading the, the first charge of international at Slack, um, uh, then uh, spent about a year and a half uh, leading the messaging team. That's the team that's charged with um, reading messages, writing them, um, uh, the conversations that you have in Slack and the notifications that you receive on the other end across platform. And then thinking about how people navigate the site, be it mobile use cases or how the desktop app is ultimately laid out. Um, so there are so many stories that, that I could share here, but I'm going to keep on this theme of international because it is where I find myself routinely returning. Next up. So when I started at Slack, um, it was a, a very different company, a much smaller, different logo. I'm still showing you that old logo right now. Uh, it was English only. Uh, people only paid uh, Slack in US dollar when they purchased it. Um, and it had uh, sort of nascent growth around the world, pockets of deep enthusiasm and then uh, po pockets of total anonymity. Um, but this was a, a huge opportunity to be able to, to think about um, how Slack could better serve different people around the world in the workplace. Next. So um, I get there and um, at the time you see a, a somewhat familiar uh, scene like this, um, lots of conversations happening. But when I put on my international localization goggles and lens, um, if you go to the next slide, you can see what, what, what I look at which is really a series of questions and projects, some of which um, like extend to language, others that have like very deep technical impl implications, but that are scattered throughout the whole surface area of what is this messaging platform. Um, be it, uh, you know, should we, how do we allow people to set their own language preferences? Is this something that they do as a team or is it an individual choice? Um, can people actually, uh, you know, use the alphabets, uh, you know, the, the many ways that they write in order to express themselves in the product in various ways? When I started, they could not. Um, what does time mean? Not everyone operates on the same calendar. Um, how do names display? A uh, platform inclus is inclusive of all, all these tools um, that you're supposed to use uh, or that you can use at, at work together uh, in concert with communication, but those tools differ depending on where you are. Emoji, um, do they convey the same things? Are there different emoji that make sense um, across different locations? Um, all of these you can imagine just uh, a, a whole lifetime of questions to go with. Next up. Uh, I offer this as a book that I got back in the day before the Slack interface was actually localized. Someone had actually made a physical book. Um, I have it right here where the pictures of the interface were actually um, translated into Japanese so that you can sort of walk your way through it uh, even without uh, the, the site itself hosting it. Um, so people were very determined, um, but, but thankfully uh, we met them uh, where, where they were. Next up. Um, first, building out a localization foundation um, across uh, how language uh, occurs in the product, but fundamentally trying to make it um, a, a loop that knowing that literally every engineer that is going to be building into Slack is going to need to touch these systems, um, let alone the people externally that will work with them. Um, and then the decisions behind what you actually use to translate um, a voice, be it style guides, style across individual translators and external vendors. Next, please. Um, a, a whole host of projects related to all of those questions that you saw um, across that Slack interface. Uh, next slide. 
Um, and then fundamentally just understanding what, what international product expansion is, which is a, a huge swath of um, what it means to build um, at, at a place like Slack, uh, understanding who, you know, our product and the whole interface and how it's localized, building out a sustainable localization process. Um, it means like what are the downstream product implications of lo localizing what happens to search or platform or enterprise and so on. Then what, did it, what it means to operate abroad internally in global scope. Um, and then, of course, supporting and learning from the many people that use Slack around the world today. Next. Fundamentally, it is asking ourselves how, uh, like, what is work and how do people work? What's important for them in that work around the world? Um, how do we best serve people around the world? Sometimes it looks really familiar on the upper I guess left for you, uh, you can see um, a hackathon that I attended at a startup in Bangalore um, that I, I, it, I could have pinched myself and then been back in, uh, in Silicon Valley. And sometimes it's really different. Uh, you know, um, here I am behind glass talking to IT decision makers uh, in Tokyo um, on the right panel. Um, and maybe in your French workplace, privacy, it comes to mind first when you think about work communication. Um, in Japan, maybe Slack is a breath of fresh air from the formality of email. You have to think about the societal setting of work, knowing that overwork, for example, is a major governmental concern in Japan and many multitudes of questions, um, all leading back to how we best serve folks um, that are working around the world. Next. Uh, so today, uh, Slack is in 12 locales. Uh, and multiple currencies, offices around the world are really serving uh, many, many different kinds of people uh, in whatever way they, they want to work. Um, and uh, it's been a, a total blast to be a part of every single one of these launches. Um, next slide. Uh, and then fundamentally, there's the question that we always need to ask ourselves, which is just where next, especially when choosing a new focus market. That's a fundamental um, question around strategy too. You know, where do you put your limited time, attention and resources? You know, where are people being blocked today? But let's say by language in particular from using Slack, where's their opportunity? Where are they coming to Slack right now? Um, what are they expecting from other SaaS products? Um, and how does that uh, behoove us to, to operate? Um, just the beginning of April, um, uh, Slack launched in two dialects of Chinese, both simplified and traditional Chinese. Um, so it is something that uh, is actively happening and underway um, and uh, is something that I uh, live and breathe day to day. Thank you um, for that blast of a tour um, across different uh, projects in, in language um, that has been uh, my seat uh, in uh, different communication focused products. Um, I am happy to ask any questions with whatever time we have remaining. And thank you, Catherine. That was that was really interesting. And if anyone has a question, yeah, definitely please put it in the chat. Um, here's one. Was it hard to bridge two very distinct disciplines through your academic career? Yeah, definitely a challenge. Uh, and, and I ultimately ended up doing two different degrees to, to explore them fully. Um, but I but it, I'm richer for it. And, uh, and it's really opened up uh, just a, a very different and kind of personal lens, a niche that, that I uh, can bring to my work that I wouldn't have any other way. And I had a question for you on the empathy-driven design, which I just love and uh, you know, was involved with the Design for Extreme Affordability class at Stanford D School and others. When you think about the empathy-driven design you've been doing in all these jobs, are there any resources that you recommend for students uh, thinking about that approach to design um, and what's helped inform you in, in going in that direction? Yeah, great question. Um, first up, first answer would be, especially for Stanford students right now, is using the Stanford Design School. Um, the mm -hmm. I don't know if that that class is still ongoing, but it's a fantastic class, um, and uh, there are many ways of just steeping yourself in, um, in in what it is to have a design forward perspective uh, in uh, you know asking the right questions and uh, holding yourself to account. Uh, and uh, I think that you know what is so true with. Um, 
uh, you know, with all of this uh, and with building anything, and especially being in, in product, is that uh, you learn by doing. Um, and so I, uh, going out there with the right level of humility and, and uh, willingness to question sort of the assumptions that have been baked into what you're working on um, or trying to look for uh, where you have made assumptions uh, and then hold those up to the light and feel, you know, ask yourself if they're the right ones and seek out data, both qualitative and quantitative to, um, to, to see if, um, if they measure up. Mm -hmm. Well, that was great. And thanks again for coming today. I think we're at the hour, so we better stop here. But we really appreciate you taking the time to share all that with us. Thank you so much for having me. Bye, folks. Bye, everyone.